Good morning, FBK. It is good to see you. I am here with Chris and Jen Bartlett, and they are IMB missionaries uh, over in Africa. And I'm going to let them tell you a little bit about themselves here in just a second. But as you know, on Mondays, we're releasing some of these interviews that I'm doing with different missionaries around the world, different church planters, uh, people who I want you to know because they're doing significant work. And because our church has a role in, uh, in, in supporting them, whether it's through the Cooperative Program or Lottie Moon or Annie Armstrong or the different ways that we support our missionaries. So this is going to be a chance for you to get to meet Chris and Jen if you don't already know them and uh, to hear a little bit about their story. So I'm just going to start with you guys. And why don't you guys tell us just uh, to get us started a little bit about where you are, what you're doing, and how long you've been there and that kind of thing. Okay. Um, we're Chris and Jen Bartlett. and um... We have four kids and we've been serving in Niger for the last five years. Um, we started off with language study in the capital city and then moved to our village for the last four years to do um, what we call church planting. And so we've been in a place where there was really no Christian influence, no um, witness, um, and predominantly a Muslim uh, village and so our role was to build relationships with people and to start to share the gospel with them and really just um, have a presence in the village that was an example of what a real Christian is um, through love helping people with different needs and sharing the gospel with them and right now we are in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, we're staying with Jen's uncle. Um, I have uh, asthma, and so the IMB has graciously relocated us and given us um, paid leave. That's great. I'm glad you guys are home for a little bit, get some rest, and to be safe. Um, Obviously, the, uh, the medical facilities in uh, Niger are a lot different <laughs> than they are in the United States. Nice. Uh, tell us a little bit about, because uh, I don't think sometimes people understand exactly when you say village, what that kind of life looks like. Like, tell us a little bit about your home, what you eat, how hard it is to get food, where the medical facilities are. I want people to get a real vision of, of uh, what, what type of uh, you know, conditions you guys are not just living in, but choosing to live in for the sake of the gospel. So we live in a glorified bush town, which really means like a really large 40,000, some people say 50,000 uh, person town. It's basically a huge sprawling village. And um, we've, we've been there for the last four years after doing one year in language school. And there's just one huge central market where you get all your fresh stuff. And um, um, we have to kind of do without your local um, <laughs> Kroger's, Myers. You got like uh, butter that we usually bring in from the capital and sour cream from the capital. But uh, basically, you're going to get a lot of like rice and starches, but you're not going to get your yogurts and your cheese and stuff like that so basically our village is what you think of when you think of africa except that there is a section where there are homes that are built more of what we would be used to and so our home is not an african hut a lot of people ask us that um but it is different so it's you know a concrete home um i have a kitchen we were able to have a refrigerator and some other appliances. Uh, pretty soon after we got to our village, we realized that the electricity is not really reliable and neither is the water. And so, especially this time of year, we will go without water for weeks. Um, we will be able to get a little bit at night and kind of like store it in big buckets and then just bring it into our house during the day to use. And electricity wise, it can be out for 12 to 14 hours a day. And so we were, early on, we were able to um, purchase a generator that really just helped us with longevity. Um, we, we were just not able to really sleep at night without electricity. And after a few days of no sleep, you get kind of loopy. Um, so we were really thankful for many people who helped us purchase a generator so we can at least have 
a refrigerator and at night we can turn on our AC during the hot season so that we can rest. Um, so we've kind of just every few months just had to tweak how we live out there um, and adjust. But there are many, lots of people living without electricity, without running water, right next door to us. So it is very a rural area. How, what uh, what what are the circumstances in your life, or what, where were you at, each of you, when you sensed God's call on you to go to the nations? Uh, I don't know if you were together. I just like to hear the story. Were you called individually as children or teenagers, and then you got married and said, "Hey, this is our combined call," or were were you already married and God called you as a couple? Tell us a little bit about how how you ended up going to the nations. So uh, I was uh, raised in a small town, southern New Jersey. And um, uh, I was blessed to be raised in a Christian home. Um, mom and dad were like one of those folks that when the church doors were open, uh, we went to church. And so uh, the Baptist church there was a gospel preaching church, a um, little bit strict, but grew up hearing the word regularly and uh, fell in love with Jesus when I was about 10 years old. Um, uh, about maybe age 14, age 15, we had a pretty good um, uh, missions emphasis week, uh, missions conference, and uh, I believe the guy was from Ecuador. Uh, he's American, but he's a missionary to Ecuador. Uh, he gave um, a passionate plea for uh, workers, for the need, and I felt called to missions uh, during my early teen years. And uh, then went off to Cedarville, and um, that call was confirmed through many trips and opportunities to serve. And then I met Jen at Cedarville, and she basically told me, listen, it's uh, missions, or you got to beat it. And so I was like, all right, I think, uh, I think she's a keeper. Um, I felt called to missions, I say, when I was 12 years old. Um, I grew up in here in Kettering and went to church um, with my family regularly and there was a missionary from Panama that came to our church. We rarely had missionaries from what I remember but this one made a huge impact on me and afterward I told my family I want to be a missionary and um, this wasn't something that was really a big part of my life at that point. I didn't really know what it meant um, but as I was growing up um, that just unfolded and uh, always felt that that call um, and always knew that at some point I would leave this this place. So when you guys were going through the process with the IMB, how, how did you decide or how did God lead you to Niger? I mean, both of you talked about missionaries you've heard from, you know, Central or South America. I don't know if you had been to Africa before a lot of times, but what, what, uh, what did God do in your lives or put on your heart to kind of draw you to Niger? Because that's not exactly like a glamorous place or a place that people would think, oh, I want to go there. So we were um, uh, finished up at Cedarville, moved to Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, we had some dear friends who were missionaries to Romania. And then um, some other friends that we met at a missions conference in Benin. West Africa. And so um, we were kind of, you know, just kind of visiting. We had, uh, I think we had just had Isaiah. Uh, we had been married a couple years. So we went to Romania and then we had an opportunity to go to Benin um, with the Evangelical Baptist Mission in Indianapolis. And so we got back from Benin and it was very difficult. Um, but we felt like in Romania, there was lots of evangelicals. Uh, but in Benin, uh, we were confronted with the great need, um, a, a very lost, um, uh, unreached area and um, poverty stricken. And um, I think, honestly, I had to finish up an elective at Southern Seminary. It was the history of Christianity in Africa with Randy Arnett, who's now with the Lord. And uh, it was an elective, I needed it to graduate. And Jen said, you can take the class as long as you promise we are not going back to Africa. 
so I'm one of those people that like, Lord, send me, I, I was one of those people, Lord, send me anywhere but Africa. I grew up in Romania. I think many of you may know that. And I felt like maybe one day the Lord would send us back to Europe. Um, but as Chris shared, when we visited Romania, we just felt like there was a lot going on already. And we just had a burden for um, the unreached. But I definitely did not, not think Africa. And uh, while we were still in seminary, like Chris said, he needed the elective. And uh, Randy Arnett, who I would still j jokingly blame for you know, being in Africa, um, really uh, spoke to Chris's heart, not my heart at that point. Um, Chris was really burdened to go to Africa. He, he shared that our first trip in 2011 was very difficult. Um, I feel like Satan in a lot of ways attacked us just to, um, especially me, to make me doubt that I could ever live in a place like that. We were very rural. There was no electricity. We got sick and, you know, all those things that you would not boils. We, you know, anyway, all those things. I felt like God was saying, it's too hard. Like you wouldn't, you don't have to go there. It's okay. Like, you know, there's other people that can go, but you have three small children. You're, you're okay to just be where somewhere else. Um, and we started applying with the IMB at that point. Um, and there were doors open for West Africa. And I pleaded with the Lord, um, to send me anywhere else, but Africa. And, uh, I was in turmoil. Um, we did a study called um, Experiencing God by Henry Blackaby. Many people are familiar with that. And I had done that study when I was younger, but I did it again with our church in New Jersey. Um, and the Lord just used that book and that time to um, just remind me of, first of all, my calling and then my um, decision that I need to make. Am I willing to go and work with him where he's already working or am I going to reject it and do my own thing and figure that I know better? And I already knew what the truth was and I already knew, but the Lord helped me make that decision to um, accept his calling on my life to a place I was honestly very afraid of. Um, and I had many people telling me that it was a crazy idea. And so it was just a journey for me and the Lord. I'm so thankful that he's so gracious with us. Um, even when he makes things very clear and we don't always agree. Um, he is patient. Yeah, I, I love that. Thanks for that transparency because I think sometimes, uh, you know, we sit back and listen and I know, you know, I, I wrestle with being called to ministry to and, and the different aspects that come and I'm sure there's some uniqueness about missions versus you know ministry in the United States vice versa but I, I really appreciate the transparency because I think uh, a lot of times we just think or just assume well God's called us called us to do it so it's going to be easy right but God calls us to do to be obedient when it's hard right when, when the situation is going to be hard when the uh, you know, the living conditions are going to be hard when the pressure is going to be hard. There's a lot of different ways that uh, it makes it difficult to serve ministry. So I really appreciate that because I'm sure there's people out there watching today who are called to go, but they keep saying like Jonah, no, I, no, no, you know, not there, Lord, I'll go anywhere, but not there. Right. You know, why don't you call me to New York city or why don't you call me to Los Angeles or somewhere I'd like to go. I'd like to live there, but um, I really appreciate, appreciate that. Um, so some of our people may not know, you mentioned Randy Arnett, the connection that he has with Jeff and Barbara. So those of you who don't know, he was um, one of the other people that he and his wife that were killed in the automobile accident that Jeff and Barbara were in a few years back. So there's a lot of different connections that we have there. It's so great to hear that just even the way that God used Randy to, to call you guys there and then the connection that FBK yeah. had with Jeff and Barbara, it's just God does some tremendous things that blow my mind from time to time. Uh, why don't you share a little bit about um, the work that you've seen God do in your village? I, I know that sometimes, you know, we love to hear stories of, man, a thousand people have come to the Lord, or uh, uh, we baptized 500 people last year. But, man, sometimes the work is slow and it's hard. So why don't you just tell us what God is doing? I've, I've heard some great things, but I want you to share with our people. So I'd like to just give a quick summary. Um, we did one year in the capital city. 
um, NAMI, uh, language school. And IMB paid for us to go to language school full time. And we studied, 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 beat our heads against the wall. But we, we graduated, I think, with a, with a B plus or something like that. But then we moved south. We were waiting. I was chomping at the bit to get out into the bush because I'm a bush person. Jen says I'm African-American. But anyway, uh, we get out there and God opened up two doors, one uh, to the east of our village, about 20 miles and 20 miles west right both right along the river all the population centers are usually right on the river so we had 20 miles to the east and 20 miles to the west there was a man an old african man who came to us from the east towards nigeria and he said i swear to god that there's no white man in this village and the neighbors said well you need to go knock on this guy's gate so he came to the gate and he said, um, I swore to God that there was no white man in these parts. And I swear to God that I am seeing, like, almost like I live and breathe. There is a white man in this village. And uh, he said, I want you to come to my village. And I want you to meet my wives. And I was like, all right, how far is your village? And whenever they say it's not far, you always have to doubt. But sure enough, it was about 30 minute drive. We got to his village. And he just welcomed us right into the whole village. And that has been a major uh, focus of our ministry for the last four years. A wide open door there. Uh, about six professions of faith. A couple of them super serious. A couple of them we're still trying to sort through. And then there's also another village out towards the west, towards Togo or towards Benin. And... Um, right on the river there. And that is an unreached uh, part of Niger. It's called the Dindi People Group. And that village is Dindi. Um, so we felt like that village would be an important focus for us. And again, we've had about um, eight professions in that village. We've had one baptism in that village and trying to just disciple these young believers to to um, grow in their faith and to start to share their own faith. And we've, had, we've seen some, some degree of um, just God's blessing on that. We've seen some guys uh, say, hey, I'm interested in ministry, um, training them to share their faith and to start to teach the Bible. That's great. Hey, let me ask you this. As you guys, and I know it's not going to be a scientific number, it's just going to be your experience, but when you guys talk to people in villages, what percentage of them would you estimate have, have never heard about Jesus, have never heard about the gospel, have never heard about the cross and the resurrection? I mean, I'll just give our people a sense of the type of lostness that we're talking about here. So I would say about 80 to 85 percent of the people in these villages have never heard the gospel. Um, I think mainly due to the fact that many of the folks that you run into in the villages are pretty young, uh, teenagers, you know, lots of children running around like crazy. Um, life expectancy quite low. Uh, 50, 60 years old is an old man. Um, so uh, I'd say 85% have never heard the gospel. And I would say much higher than that for women and children. Um, when I talk to women, I mean, a lot of them have never even heard. In the Muslim religion, um, the Old Testament stories are very common among pe the people. Um, but for the women and children that I share with, I would say it's more in the 90s that they've never heard. Um, just the basic story of Adam and Eve, where we've come from, um, all the way to Jesus. Wow, that's that's incredible. I mean, what a great need. What a great um, opportunity God has given you guys to share the good news of, of Jesus with people that have never heard it. And, and I know sometimes we think, oh, you know, uh, there's people here that have never heard it. And that's true. That is certainly true. Um, but at least a lot of people here, most people here, I would say, have at least watched, uh, you know, The Passion of the Christ or something on TV where they have some concept of Christianity or Jesus. They may not be able to tell you the gospel or articulate the gospel, but they have some general concepts. So 
I imagine there's some challenges that go with, you know, literally introducing somebody to the name of Jesus, the person of Jesus for the very first time. So that's, that's incredible. Hey, what are some specific things that we can be praying for you guys about? Maybe in your village, maybe your family, personally, or whatever. What are some things that we can call our prayer warriors of the church together to just be praying for you about? Um, I think that in general, um, for our ministry, that we would just ask that you all pray for um, the believers in the in our village, in our town. There are three main families that um, the Lord has allowed us to interact with, and they uh, are the first believers in their families, in their villages, in their town, in their neighborhood. The um, African culture is very communal. It's all about sharing, helping each other, and um, living life together, through mostly because of necessity. And a lot of these people that have come to faith um, are rejected by their community. Um, and it's really difficult for them. And um, it really it really interrupts their life completely. And uh, that's what the gospel does, you know. It's meant to change us and to the point where it will, it will disrupt how we live our lives. And it needs to do that for all of us. Um, but in that part of the world, it's really real and raw in ways that we don't really understand here in America. And so um, we just ask for prayer for them they they struggle you know they struggle with their faith they struggle with their decision and um but we tell them that the lord can carry them it's not it's not their burden the lord will carry them um so just pray for them there are three families and then several young men who have professed faith that are growing um so we just have a burden for them daily we keep in touch with them through whatsapp and try to connect with them um but they're just they just struggle and um, also just pray for us for direction. We are planning on leaving our village to move to the capital when we return to Niger for different reasons. We just have some needs in our family, educational needs for our children. There's an international school in the capital that um, we would like to enroll them in and try. Um, and then we just felt like there was a need for some community and some um, more support and so we have decided to make that move back to the capital and so that's a major transition uh several of our kids are really grieving our place in in the bush and um really just going through that we our life is just a life of transition a lot of it and sometimes we feel like we just don't have a place to just be like all right this is where we kind of hang out regularly all the time even now we pretty much let our lease go on our old home we don't have a new home yet and so um you know the lord has called us to this kind of lifestyle but it's not easy especially on our kids and so you can just pray for that transition as we transition to the capital our ministry will look different we would still like to keep in touch and frequently visit our friends back in our village but um it will just look different so that's a major prayer request and sorry that's so long but that is a major need I would uh, ask for prayer for our marriage, um, that we would continue to just seek the Lord in everything and honor one another. Um, uh, also, just sometimes um, possibly discouragement. Um, you're walking with these guys. There's about five or six guys that I keep in touch with and uh, have mentored for the last year or so. And uh, just leaving quickly with coronavirus, just, you know, we had about, you know, two weeks. We kind of knew that we were about to leave. But, you know, it was hard on those guys, and it's it's hard on me too, you know, and WhatsApp gets annoying sometimes. Um, so you just kind of – your heart is – it's almost like your heart is in a different place sometimes. Um, and that can be discouraging. Um, sometimes it's, you know, one step forward, two steps back. and that's true for all of us. And so just for just the comfort that comes with our walk with the Lord, that we would continue to seek him, that we would continue to honor one another as husband and wife and uh, not to get discouraged with like the midlife stuff, the kids getting older and stuff like that. Um, and we just want to thank you as a church in general for coming alongside of us with sending Mackenzie to help with homeschooling my wife homeschooled for four years that's just a praise 
uh, Mackenzie, uh, Matt Ballard, and Ben Ballard came out, helped out with evangelism, distributed scriptures. Um, we just pray that those scriptures, um, that they would fall into the right hands and people would be uh, learning and growing about who Jesus is. Awesome. All right, last question, and then I want to pray for you guys over some of those things. Um, obviously, you mentioned McKenzie and Matt and Ben. Um, you know, are, if, if there's somebody that's listening and they think, man, I would love to go and help. I would love to, you know, spend a week with you guys doing some things. Is, is, uh, is there, obviously, you're not there, back there yet, but, um, you know, can they get in touch with you? Can we help provide an opportunity to connect the two of you guys with them? And, and uh, as our church works with you guys, I know in the future with uh, Matt's wanting to come back and put some teams together. Uh, obviously, we, you'll have to get to your new place and see what the new needs are and all that. But, but I'm really hopeful that some of our people will, will continue to go. Uh, we want them to go across the street and we want them to go around the world. And so, so we'll connect with you guys that way. So there's basically like uh, three areas that we often have volunteers, and that's uh, evangelism, uh, storing in villages. Um, thankfully, our move to the capital is not so huge. It's only 200 miles. So uh, with the roads the way they are, uh, we can still get in there uh, occasionally for trips. Um, anyone that's interested in hearing more about Niger, there's storing evangelism trips. There's also an agricultural project that we're in the midst of right now. Anybody interested in farming agriculture as a platform for ministry? Um, and then also, um, um, I'm drawing a blank medical. We've done a few medical trips. So um, blood pressure, hey, how's your diet, you know, nutrition, uh, community health type of stuff. Uh, usually we do teams of three to four people. Great. That's great. Let me pray for you guys. I appreciate your time this morning. And uh, let me pray for you guys and uh, we'll let you go. Father, we thank you for the work that you're doing through Chris and Jen and their family. And so, Father, I'm grateful that they said yes when you called that they uh, weren't um, uh, distracted uh, by the, the ways that the devil loves to distract us with uh, comforts and, and uh, the pride of life and the things that get in the way of uh, our focus on you and our, our desire to follow you. Thank you for your obedience to make hard circumstances. Father, I do pray for the family. I pray for their kids as they need these uh, new educational opportunities. I pray for Chris and Jen, as they are desiring a connection with others. Um, and so, Father, as they make this move to the Capitol, I pray that your hand will be upon that. Open their eyes to the needs there, to see the people there that they can connect with. Give them some people of peace uh, as they move there, that they might see what you're doing. And, and as we learned in experiencing God, join you in the work that you're already doing there. Father, I pray um, for their marriage. Keep them strong. Help them to... Uh, just love one another and uh, to be sacrificial and kind amidst difficult times. Father, help them to be the parents you call them to be, to their family. Father, I pray for those who might be listening that are also uh, sensing a call to ministry or missions. Father, I pray that you would uh, stir in their heart a desire to be obedient. They might follow after you. Father, I pray that we would continue just to, to love this couple as a church, that we would support them as we give to Co-opter program and Lottie Moon faithfully and generously. Father, I pray that we would send teams of people that uh, have already been, uh, but we would continue to not only give and pray, but we would go and, and join them in the work that, that you called them to. Father, we love you. We're grateful for the work that you're doing in our lives. Uh, we're grateful for the work that you're doing in Niger. We love you. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thanks, Chad. Hey, thank Thanks. you guys so much for uh, taking the time this morning to visit. And uh, if there's anything we can do, let us know to, if we can help you in any way. Thank you so much, brother. Thanks, Chad, for the opportunity. Uh, you're welcome. Have a great day. Okay, bye.